This video is Mechanical Ventilation 101. It's a basic introduction to how to ventilate a patient in an ICU. There is surely a ton to learn about, about mechanical ventilators and respiratory failure. But my hope is, is that this introduction will give you the basic scaffolding on which you can learn more about mechanical ventilation within your ICUs. The objectives of this video are to describe the indications and contraindications for mechanical ventilation, differentiate between modes of ventilation, apply all these variables to your strategy and how to improve oxygenation and ventilation. And finally, let's go back to basic science, foundational knowledge, and think about how that applies to oxygenation and ventilation when it comes to ventilators. Okay, let's talk about the indications and contraindications of mechanical ventilation. I think of three different types of indications. The first one is what most people think of. They think of respiratory failure. And within respiratory failure, you have hypoxemic respiratory failure, meaning the patient can't oxygenate. You can have hypercapnic respiratory failure, meaning the patient can't ventilate or get rid of CO2. And many patients have a little bit of both. Now I'm often asked, well, how do you identify respiratory failure? Is there a number you can apply to it? And the answer is, is it's not just one thing. It's a whole gestalt of things. And Frankly, you know respiratory failure when you see it, and you develop that sense over time. But I think a basic definition of respiratory failure is that the patient is not responding to typical interventions, such as nasal cannula or positioning when it comes to ventilation, and they require more mechanical modes of support. The next indication for mechanical ventilation I refer to as the inability to control the airway. And I group a ton of things in here. The first one I think of is altered mental status, whether the patient took too much heroin or drank too much, or sometimes patients with liver failure are so delirious you need to intubate them. Then you can think of trauma. Imagine a gunshot to the neck or a major uh, traumatic brain injury. Also th consider things that close down the airway like anaphylaxis or burns. And finally, we intubate patients all the time for procedural issues, like going to the OR. Now, the third indication for mechanical ventilation that I think of is circulatory failure. Sometimes patients have such a profound shock that supporting them from a ventilation and respiratory standpoint can help them. Now let's turn to contraindications in mechanical ventilation. I can really only think of two. One is the patient is do not intubate. There is nothing worse than intubating a patient and then realizing later that the patient had a bracelet on that said do not intubate. The other one is that sometimes you as a physician don't need to intubate a patient because there is clear futility. The patient has already died. There would be no reason to intubate a patient who has been dead for two hours. There are a couple other things that I think are just good to know, things to consider when it comes to mechanical ventilation. And that is, in obstructive disease, sometimes putting a breathing tube down a patient can make things worse. It can trigger inflammatory responses. It also sometimes makes patients have a harder time getting rid of air. And I'm gonna turn back to circulatory failure or shock. It's enough to say that whenever you're placing a patient who's in shock on mechanical ventilation, you should pause and think about it. Now, if you want to know more about it, it has to do with the fact that mechanical ventilation or positive pressure ventilation can alter the preload of a patient and alter the afterload of a patient. And depending on what type of circulatory failure, this can be good or this can be horribly bad. Now let's differentiate between the modes of ventilation. We're going on to the next learning objective. I differentiate modes of ventilation into two basic types. There's non-invasive and invasive. Within non-invasive, you can have CPAP or BiPAP. The difference is simple. In CPAP, you place a mask on a patient's face and you deliver a constant pressure. And that constant pressure helps open up the airways. This can be helpful in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea. If you're always obstructing your upper airway and you deliver that constant pressure, well, you stent it open with CPAP. This can also be helpful in patients with underlying lung disease. Now BiPAP, this in addition to delivering a constant pressure all the time that 
CPAP pressure, whenever the patient takes a breath, it delivers an extra pressure on top of it, a positive inspiratory pressure. And this helps for patients who are having trouble with ventilation. It assists each breath. So there's a constant pressure underneath, and then the patient takes a breath, and the machine delivers a positive pressure along with it. So that's non-invasive ventilation. This works great for patients with obstructive disease, whether it's COPD or asthma or obstructive sleep apnea. It can also work well for mild respiratory failure from hypoxemic respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure. And it works well in patients with circulatory failure. Sometimes it, it allows the patient to decrease their work of breathing or alter the preload and afterload in a way that is helpful. I find that non-invasive ventilation is not a great choice when a patient has the inability to control the airway. You can imagine a patient who has anaphylaxis. Well, you don't want to just put a mask on their face because their airway is about to swell up. The same is true if you have a patient who is over-narcotized. It's really hard to keep their airway open just with non-invasive ventilation. Now let's move to invasive modes of ventilation. I'm going to start with the most support and then go to the least amount of support. And I differentiate invasive ventilation into what is called non-synchronized. And this is essentially a classic mode of ventilation. We call it control mandatory ventilation. And the ventilator just delivers breaths every few seconds based on how many times you ask the ventilator to deliver a breath per minute. We don't use this very often, but this is how ventilation started. It's extremely uncomfortable as a patient is awake. Now, we revert back to control ventilation once we've paralyzed a patient and completely sedated them. But most modes of ventilation are what we call synchronized, meaning the machine can identify when a patient is taking a breath and try to support that breath. One more time, as this is an important concept. In synchronized ventilation, the ventilator identifies a patient trying to take a breath and then triggers the machine to deliver a breath on top of it. Assist control is by far the most common. Within assist control, every time a patient tries to take a breath, the machine delivers a fully supported ventilated breath. Another mode of ventilation, which for many of you you'll never see because it's primarily used in pediatrics, is called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, or SIMV. In SIMV, again, the machine can recognize when a patient's trying to take a breath. But as an, unlike an assist control where every breath is supported, in SIMV, you limit the ventilator to only supporting a certain number of breaths. For example, if the patient's breathing 50 times a minute, but you've told the ventilator to only breathe 20 times, the ventilator will deliver 20 breaths. And those additional 30 breaths won't be supported. You can also have mechanical ventilation and use something called pressure support, CPAP mode. And what I mean by this is that the machine doesn't deliver any full mechanical ventilations, but you have a patient who's intubated and you're delivering CPAP, meaning you're delivering that constant pressure all the time to stent the airways open. And then when the patient decides to take a breath, you can help a little bit on top of it with a little extra pressure. This is a nice mode of ventilation when a patient is awake because apparently it's very comfortable. It's often used for patients who have obstructive disease because it allows for the patient to control their own respiratory rate and control their own inspiratory and expiratory time. So these are the classic types of mechanical ventilation. You have the non-invasive modes of CPAP or BiPAP, and then you have the invasive modes, which are usually assist control or pressure support CPAP, or for pediatrics, SIMV. There are clearly other modes of ventilation that are beyond the scope of this video. Now let's move on to the next learning objective, which is how to control a ventilator to improve oxygenation and ventilation.